Volume 1, Book 2, Chapters 1 through 11 of The Life of Apollonius of Tyana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus. Translated by F. C. Conybear. Volume 1, Book 2. Chapter 1. In the summer, our travelers, together with their guide, left Babylon, and started out mounted on camels, and the king had supplied them with a camel driver, and plenty of provisions, as much as they wanted. The country through which they traveled was fertile, and the villages received them very respectfully, for the leading camel bore upon his forehead a chain of gold, to intimate to all who met them that the king was sending on their way some of his own friends. And as they approached the Caucasus, they say that they found the land becoming more fragrant, Chapter 2. We may regard this mountain as the beginning of the Taurus, which extends through Armenia and Cilicia, as far as Pamphylia and Mycale, and it ends at the sea on the shore of which the Carians live. And this we may regard as the extreme end of the Caucasus, and not as its beginning, as some people say. For the height of Mycale is not very great whereas the peaks of the Caucasus are so lofty that the sun is cloven asunder by them. And it encompasses with the rest of the Taurus the whole of Scythia, which borders on India and skirts Myotis and the left side of Pontus, a distance almost of twenty thousand stades. For no less than this is the extent of land enclosed by the elbow of the Caucasus. As to the statement made about such part of the Taurus as in our own country, to the effect that it projects beyond Armenia, it was long disbelieved, but has received definite confirmation from the conduct of the pards, which I know are caught in the spice-bearing region of Pamphylia. For these animals delight in fragrant odors, and scenting their smell from afar off, they quit Armenia and traverse the mountains in search of the tear or gum of the styrax, whenever the winds blow from its quarter and the trees are distilling and they say that the pard was once caught in Pamphylia, which was wearing a chain round its neck, and the chain was of gold, and on it was inscribed in Armenian lettering, The King Arsakis to the Nisian God. Now the king of Armenia was certainly at that time Arsakis, and he, I imagine, finding the pard, had let it go free in honor of Dionysus, because of its size for Dionysus is called Nisian by the Indians and by all the Oriental races from Nysa in India. And this animal had been for a time under the restraint of man, and would let you pat it with your hand and caress it. But when it was goaded to excitement by the springtime, for in that season the pards begin to rut, it would rush into the mountains from longing to meet the male, decked as it was with the ring and it was taken in the lower Taurus, whither it had been attracted by the fragrance of the gum. And the Caucasus bounds India and Media, and stretches down by another arm to the Red Sea. Chapter 3 And legends are told of this mountain by the barbarians, which also have an echo in the poems of the Greeks about it, to the effect that Prometheus, because of his love of man, was bound there, and that Hercules, uh, another Hercules, and not the Theban is meant, could not brook the ill-treatment of Prometheus, and shot the bird which was feeding upon its entrails. And some say that he was bound in a cave, which, as a matter of fact, is shown in a foothill of the mountain. And Damis says that his chains still hung from the rocks, though you could not easily guess at the material of which they were made. But others say that they bound him on the peak of the mountain, and it has two summits, and they say that his hands were lashed to them, although they are distant from one another not less than a stayed, so great was his bulk. But the inhabitants of the Caucasus regard the eagle as a hostile bird, and burn out the nests which they build among the rocks by hurling into them fiery darts, and they also set snares for them, declaring that they are avenging Prometheus. To such an extent are their imaginations dominated by the fable. Chapter 4. Having passed the Caucasus, 
Our travelers say they saw men four cubits high, and that they were already black, and that when they passed over the river Indus, they saw others five cubits high. But on their way to this river, our wayfarers found the following incidents worthy of notice. For they were traveling by bright moonlight, when the figure of an empusa or hobgoblin appeared to them, that changed from one form into another, until finally it vanished into nothing. And Apollonius realized what it was, and himself heaped abuse on the hobgoblin, and instructed his party to do the same, saying that this was the right remedy for such a visitation. And the phantasm fled away shrieking, even as ghosts do. Chapter 5 And as they were passing over the summit of the mountain, going on foot, for it was very steep, Apollonius asked of Damis the following question. He said, Tell me where we were yesterday. And he replied, On the plain. And today, O Damis, where are we? Said he, In the Caucasus, if I mistake not. Then when were you lower down than you are now? He asked again, and Damis replied, That's a question hardly worth asking for yesterday we were travelling through the valley below, while to-day we are close up to heaven. Said the other, Then you think, O Damis, that our road yesterday lay low down, whereas our road to-day lays high up? He replied, Yes, by Zeus, unless at least I'm mad. Apollonius said, In what respect, then, do you suppose that our roads differ from one another? And what advantage has today's path for you over that of yesterday? Damis said, Because yesterday I was walking along where a great many people go, but today where are very few. Said the other, Well, O oh Damis, can you not also in a city turn out of the main street and walk where you will find very few people? Damis replied, I did not say that but that yesterday we were passing through villages and populations, whereas to-day we are ascending through an untrodden and divine region. For you heard our guide say that the barbarians declare this tract to be the home of the gods. And with that he glanced up to the summit of the mountain. But Apollonius recalled his attention to the original question by saying, Can you tell me then, O Damis, what understanding of divine mystery you get by walking so near the heavens? He replied, None whatever, Apollonius said. And yet you ought, when your feet are placed on a platform so divine and vast as this, you ought at once to utter thoughts of the clearest kind about the heaven and about the sun and moon, which you probably think you could touch from a vantage ground so close to heaven. Said he, Whatever I knew about God's nature yesterday, I equally know to-day, and so far no fresh idea has occurred to me concerning him, replied the other. So then, you are, O Damis, still below, and have won nothing from being high up, and you are as far from heaven as you were yesterday. And my question which I asked you to begin with was a fair one, although you thought that I asked it in order to make fun of you. Damis replied, the truth is that I thought I should anyhow go down from the mountain wiser than I came up it, because I had heard, O Apollonius, that Anaxagoras of Clazomenae observed the heavenly bodies from the mountain Mimas in Ionia, and Thales of Miletus, from Mycale, which was close by his home, and some are said to have used as their observatory Mount Pangaeus, and others Athos but I have come up a greater height than any of those, and yet shall go down again no wiser than I was before. Apollonius replied, For neither did they, and such star-gazings show you indeed a bluer heaven and bigger stars and the sun rising out of the night. But all these phenomena were manifest long ago to shepherds and goatherds, but neither Athos will reveal to those who climb up it, nor Olympus, so much extolled by the poets, in what way God cares for the human race, and how he delights to be worshipped by them, nor reveal the nature of virtue and of justice and temperance, unless the soul scans these matters narrowly, and the soul, I should say, if it engages on the task pure and undefiled, 
will soar much higher than this summit of Caucasus. Chapter 6 And having passed beyond the mountain, they at once came upon elephants with men riding on them. And these people dwell between the Caucasus and the river Kofen, and they are rude in their lives, and their business is to tend the herds of elephants. Some of them, however, rode on camels, which are used by Indians for carrying dispatches, and they will travel one thousand stades in a day without ever bending the knee or lying down anywhere. One of the Indians, then, who was riding on such a camel, asked the guide where they were going, and when he was told the object of their voyage, he informed the nomads thereof, and they raised a shout of pleasure, and bade them approach, and when they came up they offered them wine which they make out of palm dates and honey from the same tree, and steaks from the flesh of lions and leopards which they had just flayed. And our travellers accepted everything except the flesh, and then started off for India, and betook themselves eastwards. CHAPTER Seven. And as they were taking breakfast by a spring of water, Damis poured out a cup of the Indian's wine, and said, Here's to you, Apollonius, on the part of Zeus, the Saviour, for it is a long time since you have drunk any wine. But you will not, I am sure, refuse this as you do wine, that is made from the fruit of the vine. And withal he poured out a libation, because he had mentioned the name of Zeus. Apollonius then gave a laugh, and said, Do we not also abstain from money, O Damis? Said the other, Yes, by Zeus, as you have often intimated to us. Said the other, Shall we then abstain from the use of a golden drachma and of a silver piece, and be proof against temptation by any such coin? Although we see not private individuals only, but kings as well, agape for money. And then, if any one offers us a brass coin, or a silver one, or a gilded one, and a counterfeit, shall we not accept it, merely because it is not what it pretends to be, and what the many itch to have? And to be sure, the Indians have coins of oralcicus and black brass, with which, I suppose, all who come to the Indian haunts must purchase everything. What then? Supposing the nomads, good people as they are, offered us money, would you, in that case, Damis, seeing me decline it, have advised me better, and have explained that what is coined by the Romans or by the king of Media is really money, whereas this is another sort of stuff only in vogue among the Indians? And what would you think of me if you could persuade me of such things? Would you not think I was a cheat and abandoned my philosophy as thoroughly as cowardly soldiers do their shields? And yet, when you have thrown away your shield, you can procure another that is quite as good as the first, in the opinion of Archilochus. But how can one who has dishonored and cast away philosophy ever recover her? And in this case, Dionysus might well pardon one who refuses all wine whatever. But if I chose date wine in preference to that made of grapes, he would be aggrieved, I am sure, and say that his gift had been scorned and flouted. And we are not far away from this god, for you hear the guide saying that the mountains of Nyssa are close by, upon which Dionysus works, I believe, a great many miracles. Moreover, drunkenness, Damis, invades men not from drinking the wine of grapes alone, for they are equally roused to frenzy by date wine. Anyhow, we have seen a great many Indians overcome by this wine, some of them dancing till they fell and others singing as they reeled about, just like the people among us, who indulge in drink of a night and not in season. And that you yourself regard this drink as genuine wine, is clear from the fact that you poured out a libation of it to Zeus, and offered up the prayers which usually accompany wine. And this, Damis, is the defense which I have to make of myself against you. For neither do I wish to dissuade you from drinking, nor are these companions of ours either. Nay, I would allow you also to eat meat, for the abstinence from these things have, I perceive, profited you nothing, though it has profited me in the philosophic profession which I have made from boyhood. The companions of Damis welcomed this speech, 
and took to their good cheer with a will, thinking that they would find the journey easier if they lived rather better. Chapter 8 They crossed the river Kofen, themselves in boats, but the camels by a ford on foot, for the river has not yet reached its full size here. They were now in a continent subject to the king, in which the mountain of Nyssa rises covered to its very top with plantations, like the mountain of Tmolos in Lydia, and you can ascend it, because paths have been made by the cultivators. They say, then, that when they had ascended it, they found the shrine of Dionysus, which, it is said, Dionysus founded in honor of himself, planting round it a circle of laurel trees, which enclosed just as much ground as suffices to contain a moderate-sized temple. He also surrounded the laurels with a border of ivy and vines, and he had set up inside an image of himself, knowing that in time the trees would grow together and make themselves into a kind of roof, and this had now formed itself, so that neither rain can wet nor wind blow upon the shrine. And there were scythes and baskets and wine-presses, and their furniture dedicated to Dionysus, as if to one who gathers grapes, all made of gold and silver. And the image resembled a youthful Indian, and was carved out of polished white stone. And when Dionysus celebrates his orgies and shakes Nyssa, the cities underneath the mountain hear the noise and exult in sympathy. Chapter 9 Now the Hellens disagree with the Indians, and the Indians among themselves, concerning this Dionysus. For we declare that the Theban Dionysus made an expedition to India in the role both of soldier and of reveller, and we base our arguments, among other things, on the offering at Delphi which is preserved in the treasuries there. And it is a disc of Indian silver bearing the inscription, Dionysus, the son of Semele and of Zeus, from the men of India to the Apollo of Delphi. But the Indians who dwell in the Caucasus and along the river Kofen say that he was an Assyrian visitor when he came to them, who understood the affairs of the Theban. But those who inhabit the district between the Indus and the Hydraotes and the continental region beyond, which ends at the river Ganges, declare that Dionysus was the son of the river Indus, and that the Dionysius of Thebes, having become his disciple, took to the Thyrsus, and introduced it in the orgies, that this Dionysus declared that he was the son of Zeus, and had lived safe inside his father's thigh until he was born, and that he found a mountain called Merus, or Thigh, on which Nyssa borders, and planted Nyssa in honor of Dionysus, with the vine of which he had brought the suckers from Thebes. And that it was there that Alexander held his orgies. But the inhabitants of Nyssa deny that Alexander ever went up to the mountain, although he was eager to do so, being an ambitious person and fond of old-world things. But he was afraid, lest his Macedonians, if they got among vines, which they had not seen for a long time, would fall into a fit of homesickness, or recover their taste for wine, after they had already become accustomed to water only. So they say he passed by Nyssa, making his vow to Dionysus, and sacrificing at the foot of the mountain. Well, I know that some people will take amiss what I write, because the companions of Alexander, on his campaigns, did not write down the truth in reporting this, but I, at any rate, insist upon the truth, and hold that, if they had respected it more, they would never have deprived Alexander of the praise due to him in this matter. For, in my opinion, it was a greater thing that he never went up, in order to maintain the sobriety of his army, than that he should have ascended the mountain, and have himself held revel there, which is what they tell you. Chapter 10 Damis says that he did not see the rock called the Birdless, or Auronus, which is not far distant from Nyssa, because this lay off the road, and their guide feared to diverge from the direct path. But he says he heard that it had been captured by Alexander, and was called Birdless, not because it rises nine thousand feet, for the sacred birds fly higher than that, but because on the summit of the rock there is, they say, 
a cleft which draws into itself the birds which fly over it as we may see at athens also in the vestibule of the parthenon and in several places in phrygia and lydia and this is the reason why the rock was called and actually is birdless chapter eleven and as they made their way to the indus they met a boy of about thirteen years old mounted on an elephant and striking the animal and when they wondered at the sight apollonius said damis what is the business of a good horseman he replied why what else than to sit firm upon the horse and control it and turn it with the bit and punish it when it is unruly and to take care that the horse does not plunge into a chasm or a ditch or a hole especially when he is passing over a marsh or a clay bog apollonius said and shall we require nothing else o damis of a good horseman he said why yes when the horse is galloping up a hill he must slacken the bit and when he is going down a hill he must not let the horse have his way but hold him in and he must caress his ears and mane and in my opinion a clever rider never uses a whip and i should commend any one who rode in this way and what is needful for a soldier who rides a charger he said the same things o apollonius and in addition the ability to inflict and parry blows and to pursue and to retire and to crowd the enemies together without letting his horse be frightened by the rattling of shields or the flashing of the helmets or by the noise made when the men raise their war cry and give a whoop this i think all belongs to good horsemanship what then will you say of this boy who is riding on the elephant he is much more wonderful apollonius for it seems to me a superhuman feat for such a tiny mite to manage so huge an animal and guide it with the crook which you see him digging into the elephant like an anchor without fearing either the look of the brute or its height or its enormous strength and i would not have believed it possible i swear by athena if i had heard another telling it and had not seen it said apollonius well then if any one wanted to sell us this boy would you buy him damis he said yes by zeus and i would give everything i have to possess him for it seems to me the mark of a liberal and splendid nature to be able to capture like a citadel the greatest animal which earth sustains and then govern it as its master said the other what then would you do with the boy unless you bought the elephant as well damis said i would set him to preside over my household and over my servants and he would rule them much better than i can apollonius said and are you not able to rule your own servants damis replied about as able to do so as you are yourself apollonius for i have abandoned my property and am going about like yourself eager to learn and to investigate things in foreign countries but if you did actually buy the boy and if you had two horses one of them a racer and the other a charger would you put him o damis on these horses he answered i would perhaps upon the racer for i see others doing the same but how could he ever mount a war-horse accustomed to carry armor for he could not either carry a shield as knights must do or wear a breastplate or helmet and how could he wield a javelin when he cannot use the shaft of a bolt or of an arrow and he would in military matters be like a stammerer said the other then there is damis something else which controls and guides this elephant and not the driver alone whom you admire almost to the point of worshipping damis replied what can that be apollonius for i see nothing else upon the animal except the boy he answered this animal is docile beyond all others and when he has once been broken in to serve man he will put up with anything at the hands of man and he makes it his business to be tractable and obedient to him and he loves to eat out of his hands in the way little dogs do and when his master approaches he fondles him with his trunk and he will allow him to thrust his head into his jaws and he holds them as wide open as his master likes as we have seen among the nomads 
but of a night the elephant is said to lament his state of slavery yes by heaven not by trumpeting in his ordinary way but by wailing mournfully and piteously and if a man comes upon him when he is lamenting in this way the elephant stops his dirge at once as if he were ashamed such control o damis has he over himself and it is his instinctive obedience which actuates him rather than the man who sits upon him and directs him end of volume one book two chapters one through eleven